Good morning, Church. What a great privilege it is to be back on the fourth month of 2021. What a privilege it is that God has given to all of us to be back again to listen to His Word. Let us look to the Lord in prayer as we begin this morning's meditation. Father, we come to the throne of grace with confidence through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, our prayer is that we want you to speak to us. We want, Lord, you to touch us, oh Father. We want that bread of life and the living water that alone can quench our heart that is in dire need of a change and dire need of, a uh, Lord, a transformation. Lord, we pray that you will cover thy servant and we all will listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. An airplane pilot was flying over a high mountain peak and pointed out at a lake to his co-pilot and said, Do you see that little lake down there? He said, Yeah. Then the pilot said, When I was a kid, I used to be sitting on a rowboat there, fishing every single day. And every time a plane would fly overhead, I would look up and wish one day I would be flying just like that. Now, after many years pass, I am in the flight. Now I look down and I wish I would sit there in the robot fishing. Contentment is an elusive pursuit. We go after what we think will make us happy only to find that it didn't work. In fact, we were happier before we started the quest. It's the lack of contentment that makes the people of nation or a country or a community to more indulge in greed and possession and taking over things of the others. And that's why we see a higher rate of consumer debts in the country today. We are not content with or within our means. So we go out and get ourselves into the traps of debt and we just live. And later we realize we cannot afford it, that the pressure of the debt will press us. The advertising agency today tries to convince us that we can't possibly live happy unless we have their product. And we often take that bait only to find that we own one more thing to break down, one more thing that consuming that piece of equipment will add more pressure into that life, maybe overloading us with what we were already into. For example, you look at your children today, When they go for study time, when they start watching a one YouTube video, there is a recommendation and there is a suggested videos and there are featured videos, popular videos, and it keeps going on and on. What started out to be a little time of uh, leisure is leading towards a great time waste. They are indulging into that. Our discontentment is reflected even in the higher rate of mobility. People don't stay in the same address or a same house or a same job for more than five years. We like to move. We like to go for a better house, better opportunity, better possibility, better place, better family. We switch and we retire, move and jump and hop. Some of the moves may be demanded by the needs, but most of it is because of the discontentment we have with that workspace or that environment we are in. Our discontentment even rears its head in a high divorce rate. You see that we can't find happiness in our marriage. So we trade our maids for a different models or extramarital affairs, flirting, only to find that we are in the same problem and it's reoccurring again and again. What we think that it will satisfy us is never satisfying. So a lack of contentment is seen in our clamoring for our rights 
We think that if we have justice, we will be happy. If we have the product, we will be happy. If we go there, we will be happy. If we find something, we will be happy. But at the end, as we go there in that pursuit of finding that, as we reach to that end, we find ourselves still in discontentment. We spend more money to find that happiness. And we get ourselves into more discontentment. Even I, I know people, those who got lottery, huge millions of money ended up in streets because they are still unhappy. What am I trying to say this morning? If you look at Philippians chapter 4, 10 to 13, here is a man who is in a prison, sitting because of the corrupt officials possibly wanting Paul to be executed over the false charges that they laid on to him, he in the prison tells to the church how to be content. What do you mean by contentment? The answer lies within the thank you note that he writes from chapter 4, 10 to 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Wow. The Philippian church had sent a financial gift to Paul while he was in prison. So he wanted to express his heartfelt thanks. But at the same time, he does not want to give an impression that the Lord was not sufficient for his every need. So he is like balancing, even though he was in a difficult situation. That's what he's saying. Yes, you have been renewed in your concern for me, meaning I am in a difficult situation. Uh, if you look at verse 14, you will see, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles, meaning it was an afflicted uh, face of his life. There was a problematic face of life where you guys are showing your concern to me. Therefore, I am so happy, but he does not want his donors to think. That he had been discontent before the gift arrived. Meaning, yes, I appreciate your generosity. I don't want to uh, nullify what you have given. Yes, I'm extremely happy and I'm thankful for that. But you also need to understand, but I was more than happy before even the money arrived because I was happy because the Lord was providing for my needs. So he combines the thanking note for the gift that has been arrived and also to teach the church what it is to be content in the Lord. What do you mean by contentment? The word content in 411 comes from the Greek word that means self-sufficient or independent. The Stoics elevated this word, ability to free from all the wants and needs and desire as the sheaf of all virtues. But in stark philosophy, it was marked by the detachment of one's emotion and in difference to the vicissitudes of life. This clearly is not the sense in which Paul meant the word when he says, rejoice in the Lord greatly when he received the gift. He is not happy or he is not content because he got the money. He's not saying money was my priority, so therefore I received the money, therefore I'm rejoicing. No, that's not the point here. He says, I am heartfelt love and thankfulness and concern for you. But the point here is that my sufficiency is in Christ rather than self-sufficiency. Rather, this word talks about complacency as well. So what does this word contentment mean when Paul says? Paul says it is an inner sense of rest and peace that comes from being right with God, knowing that he is in absolute control of all that happens to me in my life. 
It means my focus, my determination, my perspective, my perception is only about the kingdom and serving him, not on the love of money, not of love of the things or of the world. If God grants me the material comfort, I should be thankful. Yes, I'm happy. But that was not the priority for my contentment. And that's what here he starts, begins by saying in this thankful note to the church at Philippi. So how do we acquire contentment? The world goes about the quest for contentment in all the wrong ways, right? It, it goes on to search contentment for satisfaction in the gadgets, in the people, in, in leaders, in models or materialistic things. That's the pursuit they have. So the question is, where do we acquire contentment? How do we acquire contentment? And when we will get this contentment? So look at Paul, what is he saying? He gives a secret. He gives us a framework to find this contentment. So the secret for contentment in every situation is to focus on the Lord, who is the sovereign Lord, who is our savior, and he is the all-sufficient one for us. When we have that in the back of our mind, when we live in that awareness, we will find contentment in life. So he is a sovereign one to whom I must submit. He is a savior to whom I must serve. And he is a sufficient one to whom I must trust. Let's look at one after the other. What this idea that Paul trying to say contentment in chapter 4, verse 10 to 30. Contentment comes from focusing on the Lord as a sovereign one to whom I must submit. Paul mentioned that, that the Philippines had revived their concern for him. Look at the verse he says, verse number 10, second part. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. So he's quick to add that word. You guys have been always concerned about me. You know, remember when we started this book initially, we said when all the other churches left Paul, were not coming to aid of Paul. This was the church that stood with Paul. So he is very quick in adding that statement. Yes, you guys have been so much of help and your concern was always visible through the kind of gifts that you have sent to me. But I know when he says renewed their concern, meaning they lack the opportunity to express that uh, concern. Because we don't know what prohibited them from sending this gift earlier. Maybe it was a lack of funds in the church. Maybe they were not having a reliable messenger to take this gift to the Paul or not knowing the circumstances that Paul is into right now. But whatever the reason, Paul knew that God was in control. God knows his needs. God would supply all his needs whenever he is praying. So Paul was the subject to the sovereign God and this most practical area of his financial support. Paul had this policy that he doesn't want to tell everybody in the church or doesn't want everybody to know what his financial condition or background is than the Lord. When he was in the prison, he was in a tight spot. Look at the word 414. It says, I was in trouble. I was in affliction. It literally means he has been pressed, persecuted by the things that's happening for him. He wrote a number of letters during that time to various churches, to Ephesians, Philippines, Colossians, and Philemon. You know, he writes everywhere. But he asked them only to pray for him in those letters. Just pray for me, for my boldness, for my faithfulness, for a willingness to serve the Lord, for the kingdom. And that was his prayer. He never said even once, send me money. Give me some money. I'm in a very tough spot. I'm in a tight spot. Send me some money. He trusted it and submitted to the sovereignty of God to provide for his needs. Sometimes it is a lesson that we need to learn in our life. When we go through these tough times in life, we might be looking at people, spaces, powers, status, where we think that we find our answers. But Paul says, 
when he makes things known to God and he lives under this awareness that the sovereign Lord is all that I need. A sovereign Lord is all that I need to look at, focus at. When he has that awareness and that perspective, God supplies for his needs. Most of us need to learn this lesson this morning. When sometimes God withheld support or when there is a delay, right? Like Paul, we have to get along with the humble means, to get along with what it has been there, what God has placed us in, rather than grumbling and panic. You know, we don't get into this all mode of uh, response where uh, we show our restlessness than trusting in the Lord. Do we submit ourselves to the sovereign hand of God, trusting that God knew what was best for us and always realizing that he always cares for us? Because Paul learned that lesson in his ministry to be content in all condition because it didn't come naturally to him or it was not an instantaneous transformation. It's a process of walking with the Lord each and every single day. The key to this process is understanding that everything, whether it is major things or minor things, everything is under the control of God. It is the sovereign Lord. It is in under His authority everything is subjected to. So He uses all our circumstances to train us, to shape us into godliness and to humble ourselves when we submit to him and he changes that attitude and when we live in this perspective that our sovereign lord is the one who leads us forward we'll be happy and content i still remember one of the stories of george muller who was always trusting the lord for his finances he lived in the 19th century bristol england where he founded an orphanage he and his wife had taken the words of Jesus literally by giving away all the possessions that they had and all their personal resources and everything. And they just started it and they were committed to this orphanage and they were taking a good care, right? And uh, one, you know, there are many times uh, Muller's faith was tried and tested and the Lord took them down to the wire before supplying the need. On February 8, 1842, uh, they had enough food in all the orphanage houses for that day meals, but no money to buy the bread or the milk for the following morning. So he's in a desperate need. So Muller noted in his journal that if God did not send hell before nine o'clock in the next morning, his name would be dishonored. So the next morning Muller goes out to this orphanage to see how God would meet their need, only to discover that the need has been already met because of a message or Christian businessman who was walking past by, being, who had been stirred in his spirit to help this orphanage. He gave a great deal of money for that day and for the next two days as well. This was recorded in the writings of George Muller's Delight in God. You know, it's in page number 115 and 116. So Miller knew that in many instances where God provided for him, when he absolutely submitted to the sovereignty of God, God was willing to provide. And he finds that contentment. If you are walking with God and you find yourself in a desperate situation, that you are not there by chance. The sovereign God has put you there for your training in faith that you might share His holiness. It may be of small crisis or a major crisis or a life-threatening crisis, but submit and trust in the sovereign God and you will know the contentment that comes from Him. So contentment comes from focusing on the sovereign Lord. That's the first principle. The second principle is that contentment comes from focusing on the Lord as the Savior to whom I must serve. 
The reason Paul knew that God would meet his basic need was that Jesus has promised, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you, which is recorded in Matthew 6.33. So all these things refer that what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall be clothed in 6. Why are you being worried? Jesus was teaching that put your focus on serving him, growing in him, walking in righteousness, living by faith. God will take care of the basic material needs. In this context, he's talking about how to be free from that anxiety. Of what will happen? What is my future? Where will I go? What will I do? What is the plan for next five years, 10 years, 15 years? Paul taught the same things in 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 11. If our focus is on our savior, or is our focus is on what we are doing for his kingdom? Is my focus is about God, or is it focus is about what is about me? Because that decides our contentment. Please take note of his promise that he said clearly time and time again throughout the scripture that he alone can supply for our needs. Let me quote that. He can supply all our needs, not our greeds, not our unnecessary desires. Right? Most of us living in the US or India or Russia or any part of the world, we always have desires. We always have greed. If you have a mobile phone today, after two years, you want a better mobile phone. If you want a car, you have a car for commu uh, commutation, you want an SUV, and then you go for a sedan. If you have a house, and then you want a bigger house. You know, the desire, you no, know, God said he will supply our needs, not our greed. That's the most important thing. We are not satisfied with what we are. I read about a story about a Jewish man in Hungary who went to his rabbi and complained, life is unbearable. There is nine of us living in one single room. What can I do? The rabbi answered, take your goat into your room with you. The man was surprised by what the rabbi said. But since the rabbi said it, he doesn't want to uh, invalidate his statement. He said, okay, I'll do that. So, he said, do as I say and come back after a week. So a week later, the man returned, looking more distraught than before. Now we can't stand it. He told the rabbi, the goat is filthy, it is dirty. Now the rabbi said, now go home, let the goat go out and come back in a week. A week later, this man was radiant, he was happy, he was joyful. He said, life is very beautiful. We enjoy nine of us every single minute of it because now there is no more goat inside. It is only nine of us. See, that's the perspective, right? So when, we, when our focus is on what we don't have, when my focus is the more things that I'm looking at, I'm never satisfied. But when my focus is kingdom, when my focus is kingdom building, kingdom citizen, eternity, hope, and saving people, when that comes as my priority, God meets all the desires. God meets all the wants. God meets all the needs that I am in uh, immediate need of and grants it. So the point here is, are you living for your pleasure? Or are you living for God? That's the question. So part of seeking first God's kingdom means serving him, whether it is through money or with through possessions, whatever we have, we just give it to God and God in return, right? We are being taken care. But we mistakenly think that we will be content only when we accumulate enough money in the bank and we have sufficient possession that we must secure. The truth is, you will never be content when you place money as the priority, gadgets as a priority, people as a priority. But only you will be content when you keep God as a priority, kingdom as the priority. 
and that alone can satisfy our life. Which brings us to the third principle. Contentment comes from focusing on the Lord as the sufficient one to whom I can trust or whom I must trust. Paul says that he had learned the secret of being filled as well as going hungry, both having life in abundance, life in suffering need. He said, I know what it is to be living a luxurious life because I was once a governor, like I'm once a man in a position. I know when I uh, snap my finger, there are people to obey me. I know what it is, but I know now what is suffering, what is trouble. But the point here I would try to say is whatever the situation may be, I can do all things. Not just little things, not just some things, but I can do all things in him who continually infuse me with his strength. The all-sufficient indwelling Christ was the source of Paul in his strength and in his contentment. Since Christ cannot be taken from the believer, cannot be taken away, we can lean on him for every situation, no matter how big and how trying and how pressing or how pushing it may be. Notice that there is a need to learn not only how to get along with times of need, but also how to live in abundance. In times of need, we are tempted to get our eyes off the Lord and grow worried. Or sometimes in times when we are abundant, we all still to take our eyes off the Lord and be living ourselves. Whatever the situation, that's what Paul says, whatever the situation may be, be thankful, acknowledge and have the heart of gratitude. And submit before the Lord and believe that you can do all things only through Christ. Not because of yours, but because of yourself, no, but through Christ. So Paul says here, when he says all things, that he can do everything that God has called him to do in his service for his kingdom. Let me say that again. When he says all things, all things I can do. And he says, he says that I can do everything that God has called me to do in the service for his kingdom. He can obey God. He can live in holiness, in thought, in word and deed. And he can ask for provisions that needed to carry out the work and expect God to answer. So all that God has called me to do, I'll do everything because Christ is my source of strength and that contentment. If God has called you to get up in the public and speak, He will give you the power to do it. If He has called you to serve behind the scenes, He will equip you and endure the times that you are going through. If He has called you to give a large amount for His work, He will provide you. As Paul says, God is able to make all grace abound to you. That always having all sufficiency in everything. You may have an abundance for every good deed. Notice the balance between God's part and our part. Meaning you are called to do certain things, but God will give you the power and resource and provision and strength to do it. So you don't need to end up yourself in burning out and uh, drained uh, completely. And that's where you find your contentment. As Paul's expression in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them yet not by the grace of God with me. Even in Philippians 4, 13, right? When he says that I can do everything day after day, right? He's trying to infuse the point that it is the constant strength and presence of God is making me to serve him. So the point here is this. When Christ become everything, when Christ becomes the source of your strength, when Christ becomes your foundation, your life will have 
the contentment that you are searching for. When kingdom becomes your priority, you will find contentment. You, whatever you are going through, whatever the pressing times you are in, whatever the troubles and trials and turmoils or spiritual needs, whatever you are in, when you seek God, when you keep God and His kingdom and everything, God will provide. God will meet. God will take care. And God will equip all that you are in need of. Today, the church is promoting that when you come to the Lord, God is going to provide you anything and everything because we are His children. I still remember a sermon of a pastor who said that if you ask the Lord for a plane, He is going to give it. If you're going to ask for the Lord to give a Rolls Royce, He's going to give it. No. He can, but not necessarily when you pray, He needs to give. Because God knows what is perfect and what is your need and what it is that is you are in dire of. And that's what God's going to provide. And because of that, you can do everything that God has called you in. Shall I look to the Lord in prayer? God, this morning we come to the throne of grace as we heard. We are living in a world of discontentment. We are looking at things and people and places and power and position where we think that when we go there, we'll find our contentment. When we will be happy, we'll be satisfied. Only to find that, Lord, we are still not happy. But Lord, as we heard this word, Lord, help us to live in this awareness that you are the sovereign Lord who we need to submit ourselves. You are a savior whom we are called to serve. And you are the Lord who alone can, Lord, grant us the grace to do all things. Help us to live in this awareness that you alone can help us. And that alone can give us the satisfaction for life. We give you all the glory and honor. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.